Well, I always like to introduce books for those that are hungry for getting a little deeper in things. And, and one of the things I talked about a little bit was uh, basically what we call hermeneutics. How do we interpret the scripture? Because so often we get into trouble because we're lifting scripture out of its context. We're lifting words out of its sentences, and we're, we're developing doctrines outside of the context. It's how the cults get started and so forth. And we have a tendency to isolate certain concepts and ideas based on singular scripture without comparing scripture with scripture and so forth. And, and we run into error. And uh, it's done in the church, it's done in the pulpit, it's topical, uh, it's not exegetal as we would uh, uh, prefer. Topical messages are fine, I give lots of them because I'm not pastoring so I get to you know, hit on my favorite subjects. But uh, you know, going through the Bible verse by verse and, and, and so forth, uh, it, it's important, it's contextual. And, and to be contextual, there's aspects that you need to know about well, how was this understood by those that first heard it? And what was the reason the author wrote it for? And how can we make practical applications linguistically in 2,000 years later today? Well, we have to understand what was going on at that time as well as doing word studies because our translations, for the most part, are transliterations. We can't get the depth so we have to find an English equivalent. But sometimes that English equivalent is based on a presupposition of the translator. So, you know, that's why we use different translations and so forth, and, and, and the text go. So anyways, how to read your Bible, for all it's worth, is, is basically an introduction to this concept on, and uh, I got this one for $2.99 from Thrift Books. You know, that's where I buy a lot of my books. If I can't, you know, because it, they pretty good book. Uh, Gordon Fee, I love Gordon Fee. He he's uh, you know uh, he comes from uh, Assembly of God background and he's uh, one of the you know Pentecostal scholars that is accepted in you know even the most uh, conservative seminaries, and uh, he he passed away. Uh, in 2020, uh, and, uh, but you can catch some of his teachings on YouTube, Gordon Fee, they're wonderful. Uh, man, just really filled with the spirit. Now, for those that don't go to seminary or, or so forth, this, this is kind of a, a book that I picked up that, that I use when I'm teaching overseas and so forth, okay? Or, or in some of the Bible colleges uh, as a reference book. And what it is, it, it, it goes through just all the different subjects that one would get in Bible college or seminary from missionology to Christian leadership to hermeneutics, New Testament background. It's just a basic introductional and, and uh, not too far in depth on all the different subjects to help you to do proper human hermeneutics. So, uh, you know, this is available on Amazon, I believe, as a PDF, but that, I'm, not, I'm not pushing. I'm just saying if you want to go deeper, you know, in your personal library or have something that you can refer to, these are some of the books. And as I say, I bring in books every week to just introduce them to you. You know, I'm not going to bring in, you know, uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon, you know. <laughs> but I, I just want to bring in some of the basic books that will help you get deeper in the word and not isolate things from the scripture outside their context to make them a pretext to what we call heresy coming in with your own presuppositional ideas and so forth. What does the word say? How did they understand it? How did they react to it? What did the author mean when he wrote it? What was the situation that he was addressing? And a lot of times, sadly, we extrapolate a verse here and there 
from the context of the argument that the author is giving and make it a pretext for some presuppositional concept that we have. So we just need to be, I'm really kind of a stickler on that. So, <laughs> so we have been discussing the person and work in the Holy Spirit. In the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing on the deity of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God. And what we need to realize is that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is God. But we have a tendency, and when, when I say we, I'm using the corporate big brush we, not us individually. We have this tendency to marginalize the Holy Spirit. Even though we don't mean to, but we, we, we marginalize the Holy Spirit more as a theological concept and conscript in our relationship. You know, it's, you, you know, oh God the Father, and we love you, and so Jesus, and so forth. But the, the, the person that, that God had sent to carry out his plan, his mission, and salvation today, starting back in Acts chapter 2, according to the promise of Joel, the promise of the Father, was the Holy Spirit. But you see, as time goes on, as you know, you go from first generation, second generation, third generation within the church. The Holy Spirit is not the one leading, guiding, and directing as much as he did as we read in the book of Acts. If you notice the book of Acts, there's no real explanation about the person of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of the Spirit. It's the blessing of the Spirit. It's the filling of the Spirit. And it's the spirit that's empowering and gifting. And there's signs and there's wonders wherever the church is going. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. But as the last apostles die off and their converts move on, what you start to get is a watering down of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to an organizational structure. But by the time of Constantine, the church is well developed with bishops and you know, divisions and, 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 and so forth. And there's issues that come up. Still having problems in Corinth. They're still having problems over here. They're still, because They've lost the concept of who the Holy Spirit is and his power within the church, over the church. The Ecclesia, as Joel uh, Jordan had talked about this morning. Joel, I say Joel, I worked with Joel in Ukraine. Uh, anyways, so we're looking, he's not an act of force. He is personal. He is that which is the promise of the Father. You know, we look in the Old Testament, and, the, you know, we don't find a lot of the formal identification of Jesus in the Old Testament. We find the angel of the Lord, you know, we, and, and, and so forth, which is a theophanies, basically, of you know, the logos in the Old Testament. But we don't see a lot of the Holy Spirit being directly uh, addressed as the Holy Spirit. You'll see the Spirit of God and, and, and so forth. But there are a couple passages that uh, where, where the Holy Spirit is identified as the Holy Spirit, separate and distinct from God within the same passage. One of them is Psalm 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Okay? And renew your steadfast spirit within me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me and do not cast me from your presence 
or do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, maybe David didn't understand the concept of the Trinity or the triunity of God, but he understood that there was another person. He, you know, and, and in Isaiah 63, 7, uh, through uh, verse 10, it says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed upon us. And the great goodness towards the house of Israel, which he bestowed on them according to what? His mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. These are the major attributes of God, along with his justice, is his mercy. Because you can't have mercy without justice, right? But where's that mercy come from? It comes from his loving kindness. That loving kindness. For God is love, first and major attribute. It is that love that the Holy Spirit bestows upon us today, that loving kindness that, that, that we are to in, in, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And as we're in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, we're in fellowship with the triune God whose essence is love and completeness within himself. There's never been any loneliness or within the concept of the Trinity. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, what's the Holy Spirit doing? He's drawing us into that love. He's drawing us into that mercy, sharing koinonia with us as believers within the triune God, a reason for our creation. For love. And what are we supposed to do with that? We are supposed to share in koinonia with each other, the community of the church, what is experienced in the triune God to begin with, the Trinity. That koinonia, that love that he has for us and that we have for each other. You look at the law, what does it say? If you love God with your whole heart, your soul, your mind, and your body, you fulfill the law. If you love God completely, you're not going to break the first four commandments. If you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you're not going to break the other ones, right? So what's the greatest law? To love. And if you're just loving, oh, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah. No problem. But that's what the cross is all about the expression of that love poured out. So let me go on. According to your mercies, uh, according to the multitude of your loving kindness, for he said, surely they are my people, children who do not lie. So he became their savior. Interesting. We go from God to he became savior, right? This is Isaiah. Uh in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Now you can go back to Isaiah 51 through 53 on that. And the angel of his presence saved them. So here we have, you know, the angel of his presence. Who's the angel of his presence? The presence. It's the angel of the Lord, who is identified as Yahweh in the Old Testament as well, at the burning bush. Who was it that spoke to Moses? It was the angel of the Lord. That spoke to Moses, the angel of his presence. And in, the, and in his love and in, in his pity, he redeemed them and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So this is a Trinitarian text showing all three persons of the, the you know, the Godhead within the Old Testament, but not coming right out and explaining it and so forth. But, you know, God never explains himself. He just reveals himself enough so that we can come to salvation. Where it's kind of all brought together in the New Testament, right? And this is something that is just taken for granted as we study the book of Acts, as we study the Gospel of John, as we study the epistles, we find that this is not something that is you know, 
explained. It's just something that is a presupposition of Paul and the writers that God is basically the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three are the one God. Because you can't have contradiction when it comes to the Scripture. You can't have one God monotheistic and then have three persons called God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Therefore, the three are the one God. Now, can we explain it? No. But those that try to explain that miss the blessing. And they fall into heresy and they never get to know the real Jesus. They never get to really have that relationship, that koinia with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because we try to define it and, and bring God down to our terms, our finite understanding, and we try to put him in a little box and say, this is how God works, and, you know, and, and, and then when we look at it from our own perspective, it's like looking in a mirror and just seeing a glorified copy of ourself on what we would think we would be if we were perfect. You know, and, and it's so sad, but it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And, and, you know, Jesus said concerning the Holy Spirit, right, who he was, identified him as the same essence and nature as himself and as of the Father. Let's look at John chapter 14. Now, remember, John was written after the epistles, uh, probably in the oh, late 70s, because he doesn't refer to the temple being destroyed, but most of the writings of the New Testament had already been completed by the time John wrote. Uh, so he, he, he's going back and he's kind of kind of filling in some of the gaps and maybe some of the things that were missed in the epistles and, and, and by the other apostles and the gospels and so forth. So he, he wants to be very specific to show that Jesus is the Son of God. And when you use the term of Son of God, he's referring to of the same essence, the same substance, the same nature as the Father. Okay, uh, so we, we, we look at John chapter 14, and what, what, what's Jesus say there? He says, I'm going away, right? I'm going away. And starting in verse 15, he says, if you keep my commandments, what was the commandments of Jesus? To love, right? <laughs> New commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. What's the essence of God? It's love. How are we known as his disciples? And our unity is, uh, you know, that he prayed for us drastically in John 17, that we would be one just as he is with the Father, right? It's that sharing, that koinity, that koinity. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, her Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right here, right? Another you know, there's two Greek words, and I'm not going to go into it deeply, but one is alos, which means one of the same kind, and heteros, one of a different kind. And the Greek word used here is alos, another helper, just like me. Same essence, same you, you, you know, power, same attributes, except the difference is is that the Spirit can be everywhere at one time, and Jesus physically could only be one place at one time. That's why he says, you're going to do greater works than I, because the Holy Spirit's in us, reproducing all these works worldwide. And we find that in the book of Acts, that the whole world was basically converted or witnessed to the Mediterranean world, as it were, within the first 40 years five years of the church that the Paul would roll into town. Here's these men that have converted the world, you know. Now they're here, you know. Just the move of the Holy Spirit and being sensitive to the Spirit of God that he may abide with you forever. So what's that showing as the 
eternal spirit. It's not just an inanimate object or some kind of electrical power or like, you know, it's a person. The spirit of truth who the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you will know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I'll not leave you as orphans, I'll come to you. And then further on, you know, Jesus tells us in chapter 15, verse 25, these things I have spoken to you will be in present with you, but the helper, and that's a masculine noun, not a neuter noun. The Pleracletus will be with you. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Interesting. Remember the name. I kind of talked about that last week. It could mean authority. Or it could be the name of God himself. Okay. But anyways, he said, we'll send in my authority. Well, if the Father will send in my authority, I have the authority to tell God to send the Holy Spirit. So you're seeing this equality in responsibility. Jesus says, I'm going to send whom my Father will send in my name, and he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. And that's how we get the Gospels and a lot of the things, right? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives, I do not give. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So he, he, he's just encouraging them that he's not going to leave them helpless or as orphans. But the greatest passage to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we'll get into this a little bit deeper, is, uh, you know, chapter 16, starting in about verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, once again, uh, will not come to you. And if I depart, I will send him to you. Now, the interesting thing is, he is using masculine pronouns with a neuter noun, spirit, pneuma. So if you, hegios pneuma, if you, if you have that and you're using that in every designation of the Holy Spirit in John 16 here, he says him, he. It should be it. But the Greek is distorted and twisted to give a masculine pronoun to a neuter word. So the Greek screams out the personality of the Holy Spirit by breaking the actual rules of grammar in Greek. Somebody reading this that was in Greek, he said, whoa, whoa, they made a mistake here. <laughs> no, there's no mistake. The Holy Spirit is responsible for giving us the word of God, right? And we'll, we'll find that he goes on to say what his ministry would be, convict the world of sin, judgment, righteousness. He'd be teaching, leading, guiding, and directing us. And we see this carried out in the book of Acts. But what is the first thing that Jesus tells the disciples that they have to do in, in Luke after they receive the Spirit? John 20 tells us, Jesus said them receive the Spirit, and they receive the Spirit, and then he tells them, well, go to Jerusalem, and what? Wait. Wait, for what? The promise of the Father. That would be, now that the Holy Spirit was with you while I was leading, guiding, teaching, and directing you, and the Holy Spirit was upon me, and, the, and it was teaching you as well. Now he's in you, but wait till he come upon you. A P. So we have this relationship with the Holy Spirit, which Jesus compared to rivers of living water flowing out of us 
in John chapter 7. He said, drink of me, and out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water, which was basically a reference to the overflowing experience that we can have with the Holy Spirit whom Jesus sent from the Father. Now, if we study the New Testament and follow Paul's thinking and experiences in his epistles, for him, the Holy Spirit was not any kind of an it. He was not some impersonal force that comes from God. But he was fully a personal. And as we look at the language that Paul is using through the epistles and in the book of Acts and so forth, we find that the Holy Spirit is God, a very God. And there was a reverence and there was an awe around that which they had a presuppositional position, yet they were monotheistic Jews, first and foremost. But yet they saw Jesus as God. They saw the Holy Spirit as God and addressed him so. Now, Paul doesn't deal you know, a lot of people say, well, Paul wrote theological theses. No, he didn't. He wrote to the issues that the churches that needed his help to straighten out problems and issues which we are eavesdropping into from 2,000 years later. It's like listening to one side of a conversation and trying to figure out what the other person is saying. He's addressing issues dealing with those specific churches at that specific time. He's not writing theological issues. Maybe the Holy Spirit is, but, but he, he's dealing with certain issues at certain times. And, and uh, you know, he, he didn't say, okay, I'm going to really explain Trinitarianism. No, it's just presuppositionalism that God is within three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was that point. And, and, and he didn't try to explain how a monotheistic Jew could identify God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. Which we scholars try to do infinitum from the third century on, you know, that, that we try to explain the Holy Spirit. And the attributes of the Holy Spirit. No, he, he, he just, matter of fact. That's the way it is. Yeah, we, but we try to, you know, figure everything out. And it's okay. We need to figure things out so we don't run into error. You know, it's the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us into all truth, right? And when we neglect him and marginalize him, we're kind of riding on our own intellect and we're going to get ourselves in trouble a little bit, aren't we? Where do we get you know, the crazy charismania in the church today. We get all these crazy ideas of what Christian love is all about. Yes, love the sinner, but don't make them your, you know, your pastor, you know, basically, you know, or you know, there's, there's, it's just horrible. What will you have done to the definition of love? Loving and accepting are two different things. As I saw Brother Dave, earlier we were talking about the children's curriculum that's coming into some of the churches and they're promoting homosexuality. And I say, you, you, you know, Paul wrote and he said, I didn't write to you to keep company with, you know, those sinners within the body but with those outside, be that witness, be that salt, be that light. But we don't let them infiltrate and accept them into the body of Christ as some authoritative figure to start teaching our children and pastoring our churches and so forth. Sinners have to come in and what's the first thing a sinner needs to do? Repent. We're offering salvation without repentance. We're offering feel goodness without you know, the idea of what goodness is. Yeah. 
The definition of goodness is who? Jesus, God. And Paul deals with these things through his letters, especially when we get into Galatians. Talking about the fruit of the spirit contrasted to the fruit of the flesh. And remember in Galatians, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to certain people and conditions that they were bickering and fighting and devouring one another, coming from a pagan environment, right? Into this new ethical environment of love. And love describes everything else in the fruits of the spirit. But what is it contrasted to is the fruits of the flesh that were destroying the church. We, 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 we kind of individualize the fruits of the spirit and the fruits of the flesh, you know, as our personal growth and maturity. But what Paul is writing to is not necessarily the individual there. He's writing to the church that was devouring itself because of these sins that were being brought into the fellowship, that were to be, as it were, brought into the koinia. But you can't have koinia when you have bickering, backfighting, drunkenness, and so forth. And if you look at the book of Corinthians, he's, he's not writing a book on how to. He's writing on something that they, he had already taught them on, that we probably are listening with one ear because we don't know the whole story, but he's correcting situations. Here you have the Corinthian church coming from sexual immorality, basically a pagan religion, you know, they're, they're not exposed. And he, he's correcting the concept of, of how they are misusing the gifts of the spirit. They were filled with spirit. First thing he tells them in the first Corinthians, you are not lacking in any spiritual gift. Well, he's not, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, speaking of tongues, prophecy, and all these other things, because those are the things he starts to focus on when he gets to chapter 12, 13, and 14. They thought because they spoke in tongues of men and of angels, so basically of angels, they had already transcended into the kingdom age, so therefore they had no use of the body according to dualistic Platonic influence from their Greek pagan culture. So they thought the sin of the body had no reflection on who they were spiritually because now they are already within the kingdom and they have no need for a resurrected body. That's chapter 15, Paul deals with that. Chapter 12 through 14, he deals with the concept of the misuse of the spiritual gifts showing that it's in 13, that it's love that is eternal. Faith and hope is not eternal, but love is. It's the greatest because who is love? God. And what are we going to experience? Love. So Paul's ministry is based in love, the love of God, not biting, devouring, and so forth that, that the Corinthian churches were trying to do by setting up a metropolitan religion within the community after Paul left and having other people come in, teaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And he's correcting these issues. So we will go in there and we will extrapolate verses out of their context without regard to the original reason Paul was writing and, and write Theological books that are sometimes not as accurate because you can go to a Baptist church and you'll find this, oh, no, there's no such thing as the gifts of the Spirit. Those things all died with the last apostle. Oh, you mean when, when John died, somebody speaking in tongues, well, whoop, they're gone? No. As I said last week, you know, I want everything God wants to give me. But I want to do it to his glory, not to my own. And for the benefit and the edification of the body of Christ. Everything in the New Testament is talking about the body of Christ and our interaction one with another. And we got to be careful as the individual who comes to Christ, as we come into the community and body of Christ, we find our place in the giftings that God has given us, 
not to advance our own agenda, but to fit into the body as part of a functioning organism with the gift that God has given us to bless others. Yeah, I, I don't know how many of you know Gail Irwin, but his whole ministry was others-based. And he was very prominent. He wrote the Jesus style, the Father style, the Holy Spirit style. If you ever get a chance to read those books, they're great books. But he would come to the pastor's conferences and he would have a stack of his books, but he'd have bumper stickers. <laughs> Love, joy, patience. You know? <laughs> and you'll, you'll see him on some people's Bibles. It says others. others. That's what it's about. We're not going to spend eternity with ourselves, are we? Unless we're in hell. We're going to spend eternity with each other. So God, the Holy Spirit, wants us to have koinia now so that we can experience his gifts in the church. I think the greatest thing that is preventing the Spirit from really moving is our lack of love for one another. It's not a lack of faith, it's a lack of love. We are independent. We have declared independence upon ourselves. We are individualized Western people. We don't have that sense of community that they have in Africa or you know, some of the more third world countries that we say, well, I'll tell you, I see more love in those places than I do here. My neighbor's dog attacks my dog and blames me. In my backyard, by my back door. Well, that's another story, but. <laughs> you know, but, but, but the thing is, the individualistic concept, that's not community. That's individuality. And that's shifting blame when there was no blame to shift. That's not my fault. <laughs> my dog doesn't like you. <laughs> I don't, you, you, you know, anyway. So. But the, the lack of civility, even within the body of Christ, I've experienced it personally. Maybe you have probably experienced coldness, rudeness, marginalization. That's not what the body of Christ is about. We get that outside. But this is supposed to be the haven of the Holy Spirit. So Paul's not writing to present a study of God, but he's writing to build up the churches and address issues about their being God's people in a totally secular and pagan society. And the only way we can be God's people in that kind of environment is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, with others-centered eyeballs. You know, Gail Irwin, I love Gail Irwin, he's a real good friend of mine. He says when people come to church, they look for the seat, okay? Where am I going to be blessed? How am I going to be blessed today, right? He says when you go in, you go in and say, how can I bless somebody today? That's our attitude. That's the Holy Spirit. That's what we find lacking so often in the place that is supposed to be the haven where we can come and experience koinia with the triune God and with each other. Mm -hmm.
Well, I, I, I think people have friends, but we have to remember, you know, that, that there's other people. You, you know, we, 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 we're comfortable. But, but remember, we, we come and we meet for an hour or two hours, twice a week. Koinia! <laughs> no, it's not! <laughs> Koinia is, 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 you know, having those home fellowship groups, having those small groups, having your friends, but it's involving everyone. You, you, you know, the church isn't the building. The church is the people. We know this, right? Oh, I'm getting off topic. Anyways, well, it's on topic, but it's off topic. Uh, Paul affirms and asserts and presupposes the deity of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity in every way as we read through his epistles. It's just there. And sometimes he'll quote the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, in his epistles, and we go to the Old Testament, it says, and the Lord said, <laughs> Yahweh said. And it says, here the Holy Spirit spake, as you, Romans, I believe, chapter 9, he does that. But, uh, but there can be little uh, question as uh, we see how Paul's relationship to the Spirit of God is foremost and prominent. I think every church that Paul planted was charismatic. They had the gifts and the operation. We see in Peter uh, what Jordan was take, telling us early, earlier today uh, out of Acts you know, chapter 11 and so forth. And, and we just experienced how Peter went to the Gentiles and, 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 and as he was talking about how to be born again, they received the Lord and what, they were immediately what? filled with the Spirit, and spoke in tongues. Oh, no, don't give me the tongues thing. That's it. No, give me the tongues thing, Lord, you know, if that's what you want me to have. But Paul says not everybody speaks in tongues. But I think it's more of an intellectual resistance than God, you know, wanting to give that gift. I like tongues because it opens the door. So, hey, I'm doing this supernatural thing. This is kind of cool. Oh, hey, Dennis, go walk on water now. No. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or, or go lay your hands on that person and pray for the healing. And guess what? They get healed. Did I do it? No, I was just obedient. The gift flowed through me. It wasn't my gift to have permanently. The only gift that I know that I have permanently is that one gift, the gift of tongues. The other ones come and go, <laughs> even when I'm teaching. <laughs> so as we, as we move on, you, you know, we find that the Holy Spirit is truly God in action within the community of the church. So we've pretty well established the fact that the Holy Spirit's God. I don't think we have a lot of questions about that from the Trinitarian point of view. But I, I want to just go into some, some of the things uh, that shows that the Holy Spirit is a person. You, you know, we equate Satan as a person, don't we? He's got all the things, all the attributes of a person. And a Jehovah Witness will tell you, Satan is a spirit person, a reality. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, they say, oh, no. <laughs> it's just a force. It's, uh, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's this thing that we can't explain but works. <clears throat> like electricity. It's God thought becoming action. No. You know, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find that the spiritual gifts are distributed to us as believers according to what? The will of the Holy Spirit. What does will represent? It represents independent action and thought of my own. The will 
of the Holy Spirit, an impersonal force does not have a will of its own. I click on the electricity light switch and the electricity flows through the switch, right? But it can't flow through that switch unless it's got a short, you know, <laughs> unless I flick the switch. And that's how a lot of people think that the Holy Spirit is. We suddenly we flick the switch on. No. The Holy Spirit has a will of its own. Of its own. It's his own. <laughs> you, yeah, whenever I hear me do it, Georgia said last week, you said it three times last week. <laughs> yes, I know. Sometimes uh, it's even confusing for me. You know, as, that, because we, we have that tendency. Because we, you know, don't see the Holy Spirit as that person so often that it, it just flows out as it, you know. Well, we don't explain its anyways, right? It's hard to explain an it, but we can have a relationship with a him, okay? <laughs> and that's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is said to have a mind, Right? implies the thought and purpose and determination, Romans 8, 27. We find that the Holy, I mean, we won't read all these, you can just uh, record these uh, down or when the class is over, I will give you a, uh, a link where you can download all my notes. But that doesn't prevent you from taking notes as we're doing this if you want to take notes. Okay, so he's got a mind, uh, we find in Acts 13, 2, we've 16, and, uh, 6, and 7, and Acts 20, 28, the, these passages uh, deal with the Holy Spirit seen as calling missionaries, as overseeing the church, as commanding the life and practice of the apostles and the whole church, activities that indicate complete personality. Forces don't do these things. Only a real person can lead, guide, direct, and so forth. Of course, it does scare me. Artificial intelligence is getting out there, isn't it? It's really becoming a thing. My daughter was showing me something, you know, Oh, write a poem about Dennis riding through the hills of Indiana with his art dog, Archie. And artificial intelligence writes this great poem. <laughs> Weird, scary. But as soon as the beast will give power to the image to speak. The mark, you, you know, we, we see all these things happen. Well, I'm getting into my revelation study, but it, it's it's... Weird. And, and, but it's the Holy Spirit that's going to guide, direct, oversee the church. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. You can't grieve electricity. You can't grieve the wind. Those things can grieve you, but you can't grieve them. Only personality can be grieved. And the greatest grieving that one can give the Holy Spirit is to ignore what the Holy Spirit is here to do, is to draw us to the gospel, to draw us to the cross. Jesus equates that with back, uh, uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. All manner of sin will be forgiven except one. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, because if you reject the Holy Spirit's call to the cross, you'll never have your sins forgiven. And we take that out of context and make all kinds of different rules and regulations about what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. There's, there's, there's churches that build themselves on that concept. Come and get saved every Saturday. Well, if you, you know, if you go that way, it says there's no return in Hebrews, you know, so there's no such thing as uh, rededication. From, from different perspectives, but the Holy Spirit can be insulted. Do not insult the Holy Spirit. I think Peter told uh, Simon. Yeah. Uh, he can be lied to. 
Nice and fiber. You can't lie to the electricity. You can't lie to power. And you'd be sinned against. All these things affirm that the Holy Spirit is a person, just as much as we would any spiritual being who possesses these attributes of a personhood, good or evil. That's why I say, you, 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 you know, uh, it's interesting that the cults which deny the person of the Holy Spirit will give complete personhood to demonics and Satan. Because they are deluded. They are blinded by their own self-will and their own logic. Trying to figure out what something cannot be figured out. So they change it. They've been doing this for throughout history. But we weren't told to understand it. We were just both to walk in it. Another area we see the Holy Spirit as a person and just not some impersonal force, as I said, is through even the Greek scriptures, which break rules of Greek to show that he is a person. And I said the, uh, the first priority of the Holy Spirit, according to John 16, is what? To testify of Christ. He'll testify of Christ. But when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I'll send to you from the Father, Spirit of truth, who proceeds from other, he will testify of me. Main purpose of the Holy Spirit, first purpose of the Holy Spirit within the community is to testify of Christ. And whenever you're reading Paul, first you find the cross and then you find the Spirit. And it's always the Spirit leading to the cross. It's the center of the gospel. That's why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11. Oh, you've listened to people bringing you a different gospel, a different spirit, a different Jesus. And, and you receive it from these itinerant preachers that are coming in to lay some kind of trip on you that you need to be circumcised or there's no resurrection or it doesn't matter about the body. And that's Paul writing in Corinthians, dealing with these issues of a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit is drawing mankind to Christ. First and foremost, the second priority is to move mankind's heart to draw a person to Christ as completed work on the cross. First, testify. Second, to draw. And when he comes, he'll reprove the world of sin, 16, 1 through 8 through 11, of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe on me, righteousness because I go unto the Father, and ye see me no more, judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. Convicting the sinner to come to Christ, compare themselves to the righteousness that God will accept, which is Jesus Christ's righteousness. But the only way we can come to that righteousness is to have the blood of Christ upon us. That's how we're perfect. Be therefore perfect as your heavenly father, he told the Pharisees, right? But how can you be perfect when the Pharisees were the most perfect outwardly group of people in the world? No, the only way we can be perfect is putting on the perfection, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? This is what the Holy Spirit does. He puts us and sanctifies us in Christ so that when the Father sees us, who does he see? His Son. He doesn't see me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right? So, so the third priority of the Holy Spirit is to what? However, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into truth. So he brings us to the cross, right? We're convicted. We come to Christ, 
And when we come to Christ, what happens? He leads us into the truth. He will guide you in all truth. He'll not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And what he will tell you, things to come, he will glorify me. So what is the truth that the Holy Spirit is going to emphasize? The glory of Jesus Christ and the cross. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So we want to know the innermost being in the heart of Jesus Christ and the Father as we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us, leading, guiding, directing us. You know, the early church didn't have this. They had koinia. They had the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying we don't need this. I'm just saying is that this was developed by those that were filled with the Holy Spirit who were commissioned to speak by the, you know, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that they would be collected and gathered, but they, these letters circulated from the very beginning. And we even find Paul quoting some passages as it were out of Mark in his letter. So there's an indication that Mark was one, probably the earliest gospel written. And Paul had told Mark to take a hike. <laughs> That's what kind of split him and Barnabas up, right? But later on it says, send Mark, he's valuable to me. Mark matured. Where would Mark be in our church today if he blew it 30 years ago, right? People still be looking at the immaturity or the mistakes that he made and know we really can't trust him. He might upset our kingdom. So the fourth thing is, is the empower the church for the work of the ministry through the gifts bestowed by grace to the individual believers. So he's leading and guiding the church, but how does he do it? By bestowing the gifts of apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists, Ephesians chapter four, verse 11, right? Prophets. He's gifting, but not only within the, those giftings are subgifted into you know, the gifts that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 listed, which is not a complete list of gifts that people will go one through nine. It's an example of the gifting of the Holy Spirit that Paul is referring to. Examples of that they were kind of having trouble with. But when you go to Romans chapter 12, there's more gifts. And as you read uh, on in, in, in Corinthians, he'll list some more gifts after chapter 12. But we'll say, okay, the first priority is this. This is the greatest gift. The less is this, this gift. You know, and, and, and we marginalize it. We say this is how the Holy Spirit works in this. this is, and we write our books on it and so forth. And some are good and some <laughs> not so good. And, and, and it's a sad thing, but the Holy Spirit gives us those gifts. He bestows this by grace, grace, gracious endowment, charisma is grace. Charismata is gracious gifting or endowment. That's why we go charismatic because we're operating within the gifting and grace of God. These gifts are gifts of grace, not of demand. They're given through the grace of God for his glory, not our own. And we so often see that abused in the church. Well, my time is up. <laughs> we'll pick up next month, next week. Are we meeting next week? I will make a mark where I left off. Uh, and uh, we can want to hang around. You have some questions or anything we, we, we have. Or uh, do you have any announcements or anything that you want to share at this moment? Just go right ahead. 
Invite others. Got a bigger group today, don't we? Yeah. So. What link? At the end of the course. <laughs> you, you can send me an email and I'll send you a copy of my notes when I have them complete, but I do them every week where I plagiarize from many sources. <laughs> Who needs the Holy Spirit when you have Gordon Fee? You know, anyways. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, I just enjoy preparing and uh, just using what God has given me to his glory is we should all use what God has given us. My greatest joy is teaching theology and apologetics around wherever I go, whether I'm teaching in Bible colleges, or seminaries, or so forth, but to break it down where we can understand it to take the complex and try to simplify it without going into some form of heresy. And don't ever ask me to explain the Trinity. I'll only tell you what the Bible shows us and because that's what God gave us. He didn't say, I'm going to give you everything to understand my essence, my nature, and my beings. He says, I'm going to give you enough so that you can love and come into fellowship with me and be saved. First and foremost. So Father, we thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to die for us at Calvary and to bestow the gift of your Holy Spirit to live within us and to come upon us so that we can be that witness of your Fellowship. The love that you have within your nature and that the love that you want us to experience and share with each other. In Jesus' name, amen.